Hello friends, this is Jim here with Science Talk. And I thought I'd do a video uh, sharing with you what's going on up here in Alaska with the crazy summer of 2019. We've had very hot temperatures. We've had extensive wildfires. Now we're getting torrential rains. I'm also going to uh, share with you what's going on with sea surface temperatures and sea ice extents. Now, I'm going to be presenting to you uh, basically hot off the press data. So now the data has not been published in peer-reviewed journals, but I know the people who provided the data, and I know they do excellent scientists. I can trust what they share. It's not fudge. It's, it's what it is. And you will see the alarming trends that have been going on. So I'm going to be focusing on uh, uh, air and sea surface temperatures, sea ice, precipitation, fires. So let's get to it. Okay. And yes, in all the years I've been running PowerPoints, I didn't even know that feature existed. So I just found out this feature to segue nicely to the next slide, and uh, almost like a kid with a new toy, right? This is an interesting, uh, this is showing sea surface temperature anomalies in degrees C. In other words, how much warmer or cooler it is than the normal, the average. As you can see here, there's a lot of red. A lot of above normal temperatures. In fact, this is uh, as of July 12, 19, uh, 2019. Ray, uh, Roy Dale Jones, that's his Twitter handle, Roy Sturdamus, okay, whatever, and presents this from the uh, 71 to 2000 basis, like a 30 year uh, average that we're uh, comparing it to. Some areas are nearly off the current six degrees C scale. It's, it's so much hotter sea surface temperature that's literally off the scale, like up in here. And if you look here, you see the Gulf of Alaska is really warm. Here's the Bering going to the Chukchi and the Beaufort Sea. Very, very hot here. And we'll, we'll show that to you later, more data that uh, verifies this. So as you can see, warming in the Atlantic, except for here. What's there? North Atlantic Oscillation at work. In fact, the North Atlantic Oscillation this year is extremely negative. Now, for those of you who saw my North Atlantic Oscillation video, you know what's going on. And for those of you who haven't, well, why not? <laughs> please, please go and watch the video. Um, I'm not going to reiterate uh, the points there, because uh, this is going to be a lengthy video as it is. So if you want to know what's, uh, what the NAO is all about, uh, I suggest you please go watch that video. Now, what's really cool, if you look here, you, that this, you can click on, if you go to this page, you can click on all of these uh, headings here and see the data come up here. This one's showing the sea surface temperature anomaly. So the, uh, the gentlemen that uh, I will be uh, sharing a lot of what they shared uh, is Rick Toman and uh, Brian uh, Brett Schneider. Uh, both of those gentlemen work for the uh, uh, National Weather Service, uh, part of the International Arctic Research Center, the institute that I work at. So um, I know these gentlemen. Um, and basically a lot of stuff that they were just tweeting out. You know, this tweet, you know, we're going to be seeing those. So let's uh, continue on. This is how surface temperatures, air and water, departed from the mean for a period of 51 through 80. So there's that 30-year period. And again, you see where the where it's hottest, it's hottest in the Arctic. You got this shot right over Central Europe and surrounding Europe, Mediterranean, and uh, basically the western part of Eurasia. Interesting locations, Antarctica and South America. 
a little cooler here. Normal to cooler. And white means it's normal. No deviation. What's going on here? North Atlantic Oscillation. Okay. So as we see here, overall, and, and when is it? This is surface temperature. This is recent year. That's this year. Things are warming up planet-wide. Okay, this is a really uh, informative uh, graph here. So we're looking at January to June mean sea surface temperature relative to the 51 to 80 mean. So in other words, when we look at from January to June, how does that average sea surface temperature compare to the 30-year average from 51 to 80? So we, it starts in 2015, goes to 2019, and then a 2015 to 2019 average itself. Fifth warmest in 2015, 2016 low warmest, 2017 second warmest, 2018 fourth warmest, 2019 second warmest, and then see the mean. What you will note in all of these here is how hot the Arctic is. Now see this cold blob right there? That's over here. So this is cooler than normal, right? Here's the North Atlantic Oscillation. And it's and it starts shifting, it starts oscillating, so that it practically disappears, starts to reappear, going back and forth. So 139 years of record keeping, this June was the warmest June ever recorded, but June 2019 also revealed a deeper warming reality. The first half of 2019. January through June finished up as the second warmest half year on record, right? That's indicated here. And this is newly released uh, NASA data shows. On top of that, each of the last five January through Junes are now the five warmest such stands on record. Only 2016 started off hotter than 2019, right? Let's repeat that again. Each of the last five January through June's are now the five warmest such span on record. This is for the entire planet, folks. This is hugely significant and hugely alarming. Alarming. So you know, yeah, it's just it's light lavender. That's what it's, you know, it's like almost off the chart kind of hot. Seven, this is seven, this is Celsius, you know, seven times 1.8. Okay, that's that's almost 13 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. It's a extreme warming of the planet. Okay, folks, let's here look at this daily NAO index. As you can see over here on this. But on the vertical scale, <clears throat> we have the NAO index. Red is in the positive, blue is in the negative. And uh, if you haven't seen my video on that, please check it out. But the North Atlantic Oscillation describes the pressure difference between the Icelandic low and the Azores high. Look at this here. This is strongly, strongly negative. The values reaching almost negative two. Some of the lowest values seen in quite some time and for quite so long. Today is the 80th consecutive day the NAO phase has been negative, which is a record based on data since 1900. And uh, the credit is from the World Climate uh, Service. So the NAO is extremely negative, and uh, this will have ramifications for the weather that Europe, Scandinavia will experience in the coming months, especially into uh, winter. As I said in my NAO video, I describe what those differences are, what the positive and the negative of phases are mean in terms of the weather so again please check that out but i wanted to show this to you that this very strong negative is related to uh the weather being experienced across the circumpolar north very hot very dry conditions 
Now let's look at sea surface uh, temperature. And really what this is showing is July 30, 2018. Now we see this, we've got this warm uh, tongue in the equatorial Pacific, stretching right here to Peru. You know what that is now? That means we have an El Nino going on. All right. Look at the Gulf of Laz, you got this cold tongue in here. Now you can see we've got some cool attempts up here and over here. Look at the above Scandinavia, very cool. Okay. Now look at the next slide, which will be from July 30th of this year. So this is brand new data. Boom. Pretty much no cool water at all in the yard except for just around like that and island stuff. But look at Scandinavia. See how much warmer that is? Look at this here. Look at the Gulf of Alaska. Look at the Chuck Chi Sea and the Beaufort Sea. Extremely warm. The warm baton has moved a little westward, meaning we're coming out of the El Nino, going into the La Nina, or the neutral phase of the Enso cycle. But you can see overall, overall the ocean warmed up. The contrast between this summer and last year, the North Atlantic and Northern Europe, shows it dramatically in the one-year change in sea surface temperature, and yet sea surface temperature is still mostly warmer than normal around Europe, right here. <coughs> in one year, the ocean warmed up a lot. And just, just compare them. A little bit more orange and red and so forth. Now look off the west coast of Africa. Now look off the west coast of Africa at the warm water hugging effect. Look at the Indian Ocean. Look at the previous Indian Ocean. Okay, so there's probably a, an Indian Ocean dipole thing going on here, but we have this cold stretch of water off East Africa. It's a little diminished. But where we really see the effects is up here. So now Looking at sea surface temperature anomaly in standard deviation units for July 2019. So what does this mean? So this graph here, the, the, the scale here, excuse me, is not a degree centigrade above normal, but it's in standard deviation units above normal. So the white bar between one half standard deviation below to one half above the mean, okay, that's considered normal or no deviation. From here to here, we're going from half a standard deviation unit to a full standard deviation unit, warmer than the mean. Likewise here, half to one below or cooler than the mean. Then here, two to three, two to three, above the mean, below the mean. So this is showing you basically where on the, the normal distribution scale you would find these values and basically when you look at most of the ocean, it's pretty much in the two to three or even greater than four standard deviation units above the mean. I did a video some time ago, kind of an intro to st uh, statistics, where I discussed the normal distribution and that typically if you go from three standard deviation units below the mean to three standard de deviation units above the mean, that covers about 99.75% uh, of the data. And plus, plus or minus one covers, you know, about 66% of the data, plus or minus two, 95.44% of the data. And when we look at the area under the curve. Again, if you haven't seen that video, you need to uh, scroll, go to the video tab on my page there. Uh, you need to scroll down quite a ways, but I've got several videos discussing statistics. I even did one on linear regression. So uh, please check those out. But basically what this is showing is, okay, this is normal here. The very few spots where the oceanic temperatures are below the mean. All of them are showing standard deviations well above the mean. And remember, water has a much higher specific heat, so it takes a lot more energy to warm up the water than it does the air. This is a lot of heat. The oceans have been basically saving our bacon 
they've been absorbing a lot of the heat as opposed to the atmosphere. But remember, solubility decreases, solubility gas decreases as water temperatures go up. Eventually, the CO2 will start outgassing from the oceans. And then we look at the same thing here, but now we basically removed the signal for June. So we're just kind of looking at a July signal, again, compared to the 30-year uh, average from 81 to 2010. Now, this is just looking at the temperature anomalies. It's not the standard deviation as in uh, the previous one here, right? It's, it's not. But this one's just looking at, and you see this interesting tongue from New Zealand up to Alaska, right? Uh, Pacific warm from New Zealand to Alaska, warmest uh, Nino 4 since December, neutral Nino 3, ongoing El Nino Madoki. Now, I did not really discuss that uh, in my ENSO video. It's kind of more of a uh, localized uh, situation that takes place. Positive Indian Ocean Dipole. And there it is, boom, boom. And remember what the Indian Ocean Dipole means for like Australia. Again, if you haven't seen the video on the Indian Ocean Dipole, Please check it out. Now we have a dramatic warming right here, west of the UK, result of reduced wind and a negative NAO. And I'll be discussing that in a moment. So I'm just kind of so basically I'm telling you, showing you what's going on worldwide before I get to Alaska. Okay, where did I uh, Well, that's interesting. I put in an NAO slide in here, and it seems to have been, I moved it around and they moved it right the hell out. Okay. Well, I'll continue on, but uh, what I wanted to say was I had a graph showing very dramatically, extremely high negative you know, basically the lowest negative NAOs that's been recorded. And it's been like well over 80 such days. And that's ex given extreme conditions across Europe, uh, Scandinavia, etc. Remember, I discussed what the positive and the negative NAO means, uh, implies uh, for those regions. Again, please check out the video. Um, I'm not sure why I didn't. I just moved the slide, but it completely deleted it so that's irks me so okay here we go let's talk about alaska but i'm going to find that slide and i'll probably uh just drop it in this video in here i'll insert it in okay so this is a sea surface de uh, temperature departure from the normal from june 28th to july 4th of this year now this is based on the average again through the three decades from 81 to 2010. So as we see here, it's mostly very hot. This is degrees centigrade, seven and a half degrees centigrade. You know how hot how hot that water is? They didn't even bother ext extending the scale on the cool side out this way because it, it, there's no need for it. Gulf of Alaska warming up. Bering Sea warmer than usual. Chuck Cheese Sea, Beaufort Sea, it's just cooking up there. Just cooking. Now, this is uh, the Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy, ACAP. Okay. Um, this is one of those tweets that Rick Tolman was uh, tweeting out, you know, just sharing the latest data. So, hot off the presses, you know, in the courtesy of uh, NOAA. You can see down here, NOAA down here. So this is June 28th to July 4th, July 5th to 11th. It's getting even hotter up here. Now we're pushing over eight degrees Celsius. Sea surface temperatures around Alaska for the week of July 5th to 11th remain far above normal. Largest departures now in the Chukchi and Western Beaufort Sea, Bering and Gulf of Alaska, also plenty warm here and here. That's more than six degrees C in here. There's eight. 
very, very warm condition. Why is that? As I'll show you later, the ice went out a lot earlier. So now, instead of ice reflecting the heat energy back into space, I'll beat up, and I have open water. It now starts absorbing water. Absorbing, excuse me, starts absorbing heat into the water, making things a lot hotter. And that, in turn, then, as I'll show you later on, starts affecting uh, te air temperature and weather patterns. Like, for example, what we're going through here for the month of August, this is raining, torrentially raining nonstop. Next week, July 12th to the 18th, still hot up here. Right? This, this little cool time, this is the Mackenzie River Delta. So it's probably some uh, you know, ice melt into the river and that the flushed out into the uh, Beaufort Sea. Bering and Gulf of Alaska, still warm up here is about Prince William Sound, by the way. So, um, very warm temperatures. Okay, courtesy of NOAA, persists all around Alaska, largest departure than normal. Uh, again, there's a sharp chain both the seas. Again, this is based on the 30 year average from 81 to 2010 and how much they deviate from that. South of the ice, the Bering Sea remains hot and one to three degrees C in the deep Gulf of Alaska. One to three degrees, that's, that's what we're seeing here. Now, the Bering Sea is it's pretty shallow. It's only about like 50 meters on average deep. So, we're here, the Gulf is a little, the Gulf of Alaska is deeper, so you're going to get some, uh, probably some more diffusing, diffusement of temperature to the water column. Some mixing. Now, the next week, July 24th to July 30th, still warm. Right, the remain well above the 81 2010 normal mixing of surface heat deeper in the water in the Bering and Southern Chukchi Sea, thanks to a couple of storms this past week. So basically, kind of help cool things down. Down will affect sea ice development this fall. So that remains to be seen. And then an overall average for the entire month of July, and you can see here's just completely warm. So sea surface temperature, uh, the temperature departure from from normal for July. From around Alaska, very warm water north of the Bering Strait, relative to the end of the 81 2010 average, is a consequence of record low extent early loss of sea ice. SST, sea surface temperature data courtesy of NOAA. So now let's look at the Gulf of Alaska. Okay. I'm going to look now here. This little green that shows the area in which the data was collected in this little wedge insert. So we're looking from the years 1900 to 2019. Gulf of Alaska is quietly cooking. May through July, average sea surface temperature edges out 2016 is the warmest early summer of record. So yes, sea surface temperature overall warmer for May, July than during the blob years. Blob years was this interesting thing that happened in the Gulf where uh, just this warm blob of water. Never really did quite figure out what was going on there. But let's look at this uh, graph here. So we have uh, degree C for the sea surface temperature up here on the scale. And what we've done is they've taken a May through July average. So let's say you look at the year 19, uh, so it looks like uh, 16. So the the sea surface temperature in the Gulf of Alaska for this region, from May through July, so they average it out that year, is about uh, 7.4 degrees C. If I want to look at in the year 1938, uh, so again, the average temperature for the May, June, July uh, stretch of time would be about the 9.3. So you get an idea. So this gives you, you know, a value for each of these three month period for each year. So now you fit a, a curve through the data. Fit the curve. If you run a linear regression, you know, this is a curve linear, but if, let's say you run a linear regression analysis and put a line through here, you'll see that the slope is positive. So it's showing an increasing trend. Basically, the Gulf is warming up. The blue dots represent the 10 coldest years. 
most of it in the early part of the 20th century. A couple of little shots here during the 70s. 70s was a cold decade. You had a very strong La Nina. So that's going to have some cold water infiltration there. And then you have the 10 warmest, these are red dots here. Seven of them are from 1997 or so onward, with four in the last five years. Some reaching the highest temp temperature be, uh, that we record, uh, have seen recorded. Gulf is warming up. Remember, sea surface temperature is warming up. That's a lot of heat, specific heat of water. It takes a lot of energy to warm up water than it does air. Same line. Now, this is, these are interesting graphs. Um, don't worry about what's going on here. This is what I want you guys to concentrate on. So what are we looking at? Combined daily ice extent from 79 to 2019. That's a 40-year average. So on the vertical scale, we have sea ice extent in square kilometers. And on the, well, the higher the number, basically the further south the sea ice extended to. So as we would expect, as the season progresses, the ice starts melting. And so it's melting, so we expect to see the sea ice extent decrease. And that's what this shows. And typically, if you look right, I can run it right here. September 15 is typically when you hit the low spot. In other words, you know, that time of the year, which is oceanic summer, is when you see the sea ice at its minimal extent. Minimal, minimal extent. So the black line here shows the 20, uh, 1981 to 2010 median. Median, now remember, is not average, it's a different measure. The median is the middle value. It's what separates 50% of the data that you found below it, 50% above it. So it's like the 50th percentile. So the median value. So if I was to count these little squiggly lines, half of them would be above the black line, half would be below the black line. 2018 is this red line. Okay. And 2019, this is updated through July 13th. That's where this ends. Taking off satellite. Okay. So we see decreasing. But here's the thing I want you to look at. When you see all these other here, they start to decrease about June, the early part of June, for the most part. Look at this here. Right off the gate, bang, starts decreasing. In May, that's a whole month earlier. This, the sea ice is being lost a whole month earlier. That means what? Well, that allows for more sun energy to be absorbed by the now open water. And then the continual absorption of sun energy is what, uh, you know, was why we had such hot temperatures in the waters that I just showed you. So the sea ice is going out a, a month earlier. Now, I was part of the team. We were doing, we were collecting this kind of a data. You know, when the sea ice goes, starts melting the extent, when it starts refreezing, all that kind of stuff. We, we were doing all that. We were in the Chuck Chi and, and Gulf we, we were out there. So that, that's what should be taken away from this. Northern Alaskan coast is the increasingly clear of ice as the higher concentration ice beyond the barrier island slowly melts. Next slide. Okay, this is the Chukchi Sea daily ice extent. Okay, this is now through July 27. Again, you see how it's just bombing down. And it started earlier. They started a whole month earlier. Sea ice around Alaska is collapsing. Chukchi Sea ice extent now 41% lower than the previous lows. This is 2017. Open water to 76 degrees mm -hmm. north latitude. Big impact from exposing so much water so early in the season. Very high sea surface temperature anomaly. This is going to affect weather. This is going to affect uh, air temperatures, as we'll see later on. Okay. 
We'll get through July 27th. I'm just showing you a little further along here. First one is July 13th, July 27th. And it's starting to dive down. The combined sea ice extended Chuck G and Barrett Beaufort Seas is the lowest of record. As of July 27, Beaufort is fourth lowest per day. The only close year is 2008, which had less ice in the Beaufort, but much more ice in the Chuck G. Here we're getting less ice in Chuck G and less ice in the Beaufort. More, more open water. And then further, now it's good through August 17th. So sea ice remains far from the Alaska coast. Combined extent for the Chuck Chi and both the seas is, uh, hey, you got to see there, uh, quick. It's third lowest for August 17th. The Chuck Chi sea extent remains low as a record at 13% of the 81 to 2010 average. Both for sea ice, 51% of that. Really low, and if you look at this, you know, you see how it's may not be as low as 2008. I think this line here is the 2008, um, if I recall correctly. So, but it's going to be one of the lowest now. Look on the flip side. So, I showed you what's happening with the the ice extent. Now let's look at the open water extent. The smooth median, which means that from uh, the period of about 1979 through 2019, about you know, 40 so year cycle, about, I don't know what that was about, you're going to find that about half of these uh, histogram bars are going to be above this black line and half will be below it. Chuck G. C. as of July 28th is approaching 80% open water. This is from the NSIDC uh, data. Prior to 2007, every year still had less than 50% open water. Prior to 2007. Okay. Here's 50%. Here's 2007. Right? Open water is under 50%. You get to 2008, and with just a couple exceptions in here, we're seeing a lot above 50% open water. In 30 years, the typical area of open water has gone from about 30% to about 60%. They see an area about to stop a little larger, well, much larger than Texas. So, so it makes sense. If you lose in the sea ice extent, then that means the open water is going to increase. So it's kind of collaborative data here. So we've got the percent on the vertical scale, and there's the median. Notice the median is increasing. We're having more and more open water as we have decrease and more decreased, uh, further decreased the uh, sea ice extent. Okay, combined Chuck Chi and Beaufort sea ice extent. No surprise here. You see the decline. And again, this is the median line, which is the through what's called smooth extent cubic spline. It's a analytical uh, procedure. But if you think of it as, as like a, the median line we showed you previous. So again, ice extent in the square kilometers, and the trend is clear. This is over you know, three, almost four decades. The trend is very clear. It's decreasing. The Arctic is the fastest warming region and the most warming region on the planet. Now, this is an interesting graph. With weeks of melt ahead, the Chukchi Sea ice extent is already lower than any day in any year between, before 2007. Chuck G. C. is well on the way becoming the season with sea ice free basin. So let's look at what this is here. So we have dates here from August 1st through, say, October 1st. And we have the sea ice extended square kilometers. So let's take um, 1980. Okay, 1980. So this is for August. It's like uh, August 14th. So 1980 on August 14th, you had about 455,000 uh, square kilometers of sea ice extent. If I look at this one here from 1990, which is about August 31st or so, it's a little under 300,000 square kilometers. And to get the idea now of how to read this or to get the information off this chart. But what you note here is that 
the sea ice extent decreases and decreases as we get into basically September, the oceanic summertime. Right? But look what's happening here in 2019. We are approaching in August values we usually don't see until mid September. So we're seeing a four to six week. What was what we expect to see in mid September? We're seeing four to six weeks earlier in the beginning of August, just like with the ice melting earlier that I showed you before, a whole month earlier. This is why the saying that the Chuck T. Wallen would become a seasonally sea ice free basin. Look at it. The trend, you know, this is. Uh, you know, through August 11th, okay, continues down there. It's probably going to be bottoming out here before September. Pretty incredible. So this is a very informative uh, graph here. So that's what I want. That's the the latest data on the sea ice that I have to share with you. Now let's turn our attention to what's going on in the air temperature thing. If you have open water absorbing the heat energy as opposed to reflecting it back in space, it makes sense that you're going to give the water is going to give off some of that latent heat energy and start warming the air around it. But also air temperatures are up, and we're seeing that here. Okay, here's the air temperature, 26 degrees Celsius up to greater than 32 degrees Celsius, like in here and here. It's warm, especially, you know, the western part, good portion of Alaska, but the western part is really, really warm. There, there's spare banks. Record breaking heat in Alaska has exacerbated clusters of wildfires burning throughout the state. That's what this shows you. Now remember, warm air can hold a lot of moisture. But a lot of times it does what? It sucks the moisture out of the ground, making the ground really dry. And the ground is really dry and it's really hot. You get dry lightning strikes. That's a recipe for fires. And we had fires. There was a fire less than 20 miles from my house. Luckily, the rains came and pretty much put the kibosh on that. But even after the heavy rains, you can get a few hot spots flare up, which typically happens later on in September. I'll show some graphs of that, illustrating that. But this figure here, this is cloud, because here's the Gulf of Alaska. All this here, and this here, this is smoke. This is the smoke from the fires. Here's Fairbanks. Very intense around the Fairbanks area. Very intense here. It's probably, probably looks like the low Yukon, whatever. It was smoky as all hell. A lot of fires burning. So this is uh, a graph showing cumulative acreage burned. Alaska wildfire acreage for 2019, that's this red line here, exceeded one and a half million acres, right? So here's a one million, so 1.5 million acres. It's right there, so it exceeded it. As of Saturday morning, July 13th. Solidly in third place, most acres burned to date since 1991. So that's what these graphs show, okay? The black line is 2015, a very smoky year. It burned intensely, got some uh, some uh, torrential rains, helped out, it pretty much stopped, it leveled off. 2004, this just kept burning, right? Some rains kind of slowed it down, stopped it. The rain stopped, and you had some hot spots flare up again. And that's why it burned over six uh, million acres. This was a really smoky year. I remember one morning I woke up, looked out the window, and I thought I was on Mars. The sky was a salmon color. And you, you can see all these, like this orange line here is 2009. The, you know, it burned, had some heavy rain, then pretty much stopped it. Same thing here for 2002, pretty much stopped it. Uh, 2005, it looked like it flared up a little bit. But uh, 2015 and 2004 were some pretty bad years of fires. 
and the source is Alaska Interagency Coordination Center. Rick Tallman, that's the gentleman providing a lot of the uh, figures I'm sharing with you. Okay, I want to play this uh, little animation video here for you. And it's looking at the Alaska Statewide Temperature Index from January 1st through March 31st of 2018. Uh, that's for the, for the first second. This actually, this whole thing, as you watch the graph uh, play out, will carry it through to uh, pretty much the current uh, situation. So what do we got going on here? This index is based on the 30-year average from 81 to 2010. Daily normal standard deviation of 25 stations. That's this here. All these little dots here represent some stations around the state of Alaska uh, recording the data. The value of plus one means that the day is warmer than 10% of all above normal days. The value of plus eight means the day is warmer than 80% of all above normal days, etc. And you can say the same is true for negative numbers. Minus one, the day is cooler than 10% of all above normal. You get the idea. So 30-day uh, average is shown as the black line, which is a running average. So let's uh, let it go here. Then to March, you can see it's mostly warm. A couple of stretches where it's cool, probably from precipitation events. So right now it's still in the 2018. For the most part, the black line is pretty much above the normal above the average the average is the horizontal line here look at this stretch here september october really warm and a little cool down in december january but no it warms right back up in january with that february really warm march warm a little dip in april back up in april and may we're now in this year okay so um let me just fast forward okay, and we'll, i will stop it to, towards the end and basically it takes us up to pretty much july 9th of 2019. as you notice in this graph it is considerably warmer than the average considerably warm not once did we see this black line dip south of the average. Not once. Remember earlier in this video, I talked about how um, January to June was really, really warm? Well, you just saw it here in this animation. So the state of Alaska is really warming up. And this is the data that shows it. Oh, well, I thought you find it so interesting for me to include this little video in the part of the overall presentation of how things are so drastically changing up here in Alaska. Okay. Back to the slideshow. Okay. Another monthly record set. The low temperature on Monday at Ukiyatvik which is basically barrel, but 51 degrees Fahrenheit, 10.6 C, is the highest daily low temperature of record in July. In other words, you know, you, you all know, familiar with, you know, the overnight low was, right? Well, the overnight low was the highest ever recorded. So we're having high overnight lows. Previous record was 10 degrees C or 50 F, set just three years ago. So let's look at this. And this, uh, as, will, as you can see, will dovetail with the video I just presented to you. But Ukiatvik, then Dead Horse, which is basically Prudhoe Bay, and then Kakto, Kaktovik, which is a little island right off the coast, uh, basically opposite the, uh, the 1002 region of Anwar. It's about 100 folks that live there year round. So we're going from west. To east across the uh, Alaska and uh, uh, Arctic coastline. <clears throat> the daily temperature departures along the Alaska and Arctic coast west to east from July 24th. First 205 days of the year averaging more than 
greater than or equal to five degrees C or nine degrees Fahrenheit above, again, the three decade normal from 81 to 2010. It's true that not every day is warmer than normal because that's called weather. But you can see how, especially when you get into the you know, January through March, April region, it's just hot, hotter than normal. Still warmer than normal here, but this region here, this section, very, very warm. And you had NOAA, NCEI, you see the data sources there. There is the, the Alaska statewide 12 month running average temperature starting from about 1926 to 2019. So 26 degrees, that's the average for the entire state, whether it be from Point Barrow all the way down to Ketchikan. You average it all out, the average temperature year-round for Alaska is 26 degrees Fahrenheit, about minus uh, 3.6 C. So yes, average temperature year-round for Alaska is below freezing. Okay. So temperature below 26 is considered a de cool deviation, above 26 a warm deviation. And basically, once you get out of the 70s, the strong La Nina, yeah, you got a couple of little minor dips along the way here. It's pretty much warming up. The average, when you look at 12 month running average, it's warming up. Now, 12 month running average, if you go from January through December, February through January, March through February, etc., and you keep, it, keep tallying it and then plotting it. So the trend is quite clear. You know, it, was warm, it was warmer here in the early part, then we had a couple of cool decades, and now it's just, we just look at these spikes here. Really considerably warmer. <clears throat> this is the 2016 peak that's referenced in the uh, caption. So July 2019 temperature departures from the, again, the 81 to 2010 normal. While the departures not large relative to what can occur in winter, July temperatures at the monthly scale are tightly constrained. Most of the values over five plus five are records for July. So 9.2 here, six is 0.74 at bound. This is, look, at, look at the coast here, it is Kakovic, it is dead horse. Setting record temperatures. Yeah, that's I think is Old Crow in the Yukon Territory. That's probably, uh, Eagle and that uh, white horse, I would imagine. <coughs> Excuse me. But as you can see, there's a lot of very higher than normal temperatures. Statewide July average temperatures from 25 to 2019. It's pretty much flat line until about 1962 or three or so, and then it starts increasing. So again, if I want to know, okay, the in 1950 the average July temperature was about, you know, let's see, that's 52, 53, about 53.5 degrees. I just read it right across. So if I want to know in 1962 or so, oh, it looks like it was about 54.5 degrees. So again, you get an idea of how to read the chart here. The blue dots are the 10 coldest. The red dots are 10 warmest. And again, look at the red dots all from 1990 on. Every one of the 10 warmest Julys has occurred since 1990. None of the 10 coolest have occurred since 1981. None. What's now a typical July, what's now a typical July, that's over here, would have been a record warm July prior to the late 60s. Here's the late 60s, right? 52 point, say, uh, three, uh, 52.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Back then, now it's, what's that, almost 55? That, this from 1962 on is clearly a trend of increasing temperature. And then this is just another way of showing it. Now it's official, last got the warmest month on record in July 2019, by nearly a full degree. Look how high it's reaching up. 
that's the next highest one, which is the uh, 2008 or so. <coughs> so we're seeing the average temperature. The black, the, the this horizontal, like this gray line would be the 75 year mean of 52.76 Fahrenheit. So now this is an interesting one here. This is looking at the maximum temperature percentiles. This one looks at the minimum temperature. So what was the temperature high or the temperature lows? So again, when you get into the blue, that's a uh, uh, record cold, record cooler, a uh, very much cooler, cooler, average, above average, very much above average, and record above average. So we see for the southern Alaska, not counting the panhandle, southern portion of Alaska, this is the Kenai Peninsula, and they're going out into the Alaska Peninsula, down to the Aleutian. This is warm. Second, this is setting records, and here's Anchorage. The whole state is warm, but this is really setting a record. But here's the kicker. Look at the minimum temperature. All along the coastal areas here, you know, and big portion of the tongue right into the interior, setting record overnight temperatures. In other words, the low temperature when were new high temperatures. So let's just say, you know, uh, an average overnight low temperature is 42 degrees Fahrenheit. Now you see it's 46. Okay, that's higher. That might be a record. So that's, as I said earlier, oops, I want to go, go back to that one. As I said earlier, you're going to have open water here. The latent heat energy is going to help warm up the air at night. Right? Think about what happens if you, if you live by the shore. It gets night, nighttime. You have that warm breeze, right, off the ocean. Basically, what's going on here, Mr. Curson? So... The low temperatures were basically new highs. Those temperatures. All the, the whole state was warm. Whole state. Notice the different patterns of the deep red, the larger extent of record warm minimum temperatures related to warm oceans, high moisture, and clouds. So now this graph shows just the average temperature. So min, max, the whole thing. And what do we see here? The entire, entire state is burning up. The only exception is the very southern portion of the panhandle, where it was the you know, fifth to tenth warmest. But everywhere here is the fourth to the warmest ever. This entire state is warmed up. Warmest July ever. July is much warmer than normal in all regions of Alaska, with large area having a warmest July in the 95 years of data. The Southern Panhandle was the only area that did not have a top four on this July. It's this yellowish area there. So why do I share all this with you? Because what happens in the Arctic, what happens in Alaska, the Arctic affects the entire planet. Right? I discussed with you, you know, you know having it so much warmer, how the temperature gradients, the pressure gradients are affected, how this then affects the, uh, the jet stream. You know, we talked about the oscillatory system, and then we talked about the weather patterns that happen. All of what's happening here is going to affect the rest of the planet. And we're already seeing it. So this is an interesting graph. This is courtesy of Brian uh, Brett Schneider. And this curve is here, that's the normal bell curve. Okay. So again, this is showing uh standard deviation unit. So if we go right to the top of the curve, that's where the mean value is found. And the mean value, since uh, you're right at the mean, you don't have any deviations from the mean, so your standard deviation unit would be zero. I, again, I discussed this in my uh, intro stat video, so please check that out. So uh, if I look over to here, right, this is uh, you know zero to 0 0.5, standard deviation units below the mean, okay, 0.5 to 1 below the mean, over here would be 0 0.5 to 0 0.5 above, 
0.5 to 1 above, etc. Very similar to the earlier graph I showed, you know, you had this, the, the bar scale of the standard deviation units. So if you go from, uh, look here, this is uh, 1 to 1.5, so this is 1.5 to 2. So you go from minus 1.5 to 2 to Pause 1.5 to 2, that contains 95.4% of the data, right? You only got this little bit there, a little bit there. <clears throat> if you go between 1 plus, uh, minus 1 to plus 1, that's 64% of the data. If you look at the distribution curve. So now, when you look at this here, right, what do we see here? Starting in like 2015, we see a push of the histograms to the right. It's skewing. Annual distribution of Alaska daily temperatures using standard anomalies 2011 to 2019. A dramatic shift toward persistent warm anomalies for the last six years. You see it right here. It's pushing. It's not conforming to what we'd expect the normal distribution. This is 2011. Pretty much is here. Okay, got a little blurb down. Okay, no big deal. Pretty much here. Pretty much here. We start getting to 2015. Look how it's just pushing to the right. We're not seeing anything down on the minus 1 to 1 1.5, 1.5 to 2 realm. So this is also another way of showing how much the state is warming up. <clears throat> okay, so now it brings us to rainfall. And it's kind of hard to read here, but <clears throat> we see the dark green. The, the value before the decimal is a zero. <laughs> okay. So we see the red value, that's like we got really pissed on heavily. <laughs> rainfall total since Thursday a.m. around Alaska. At any one place, most of the rain fell in about 24 hours. Any amounts over 1.5 inches are very significant. Okay. Not all of these, you know, are completely accurate. There's some instrument reporting, decoding, with some errors that could be. So this is the amount of rain that fell in a 48-hour period from August 1st to the 3rd. 48 hours. Nearly 5 inches. That's over 5 inches. That's a lot of water. Where's that coming from? Open water here. <clears throat> So now, okay, so I just showed you August 1 through August 3. Now let's look at this 24-hour period from August 14th to the 16th. Total rain. Look here in Fairbanks, 2 to 3 inches. That's, again, another 48-hour period. So the whole, whole stage is getting, you know, so we were very hot in July, and now it's flipped, and now we're just getting torrentially poured on. Again, National Weather Service, uh, Fairbanks, NOAA, Rick and uh, Brian uh, work for the NWS. So far in the month of August, Fairbanks has received 4.28 inches of rainfall. Makes the 29th the fourth wettest. With over half of a month left to go. Okay, this is on August 14th. That tweet did not include what was expected to happen over the next 48 hours. So you can probably add two to three inches, depending what fell. I didn't see what the number the exact values were. You probably add, it, well, you will add considerably more to this amount. I want to introduce to you uh, a concept that a meteorologist uses called precipitable water, or PW which is the amount of moisture in a column of air above the surface. So the moisture plume itself is already a record breaker. So the moisture plume is referring to the PW. At several locations separated by hundreds of miles, Tuesday brought the wettest atmosphere ever observed in 70 plus years since a regular radio sign by the balloons had been launched over Alaska. So basically you think of this sort of like as potential amounts of precipitation. So precipitable water, not the moisture in the column of air above the surface. How much of it will actually land on the surface? We don't know, but 
but this gives us an idea of what the potential of actual precipitation reaching the ground could be. So Bethel, 1.86, breaks the record 1.77. Fairbank, 1.59, breaks the record 1.57. Anchorage, 1.76, breaks the record 1.67. <coughs> Then on the flip side, Juneau, which is known, you know, the southeast pan is known for always being rainy, hasn't seen measurable rain since July 29th, making this the first August in 124 years of record keeping to go this long without rain. So we've got dry weather. Look at Juneau here. Last time Juneau Airport is 16 days or more with no measurable precipitation, twice in the same year, was in 58. Record six. No, I did that. Record 16 days ending March 22nd, 19 days ending June 9th, 59, 58. <clears throat> With the Juneau Airport, 2019 has already had two dry streaks of 16 days or more. <coughs> Got some water here. Sixteen days ending March 9th and eighteen days ending July eleventh of this year. Now it's the third stretch of dry weather. This has never happened. Three stretches of no precipitation, sixteen days more in the same year. Not going back to thirty-six. So do you know this is exactly on the warm being warm? Oh it's gonna be being dried instead of being precipitated. And now we come to Anchorage. Summer of 2019 Anchorage has been like no other. Hot, dry, smoky, thunder. This is just some of the highlights, low lights, however you want to look at it. All warm, all the time, warmest month, average temperature. Warmest June, warmest first half of August. All time highest temperature, 90 degrees Fahrenheit on July 4th. Anchorage until then has never ever recorded 90 degrees Fahrenheit ever, any day of the year. And it hit 90 degrees on July 4th. Warmest week, 3 to 9, 71.4. Most days above 70 degrees Fahrenheit, because 46, 8 above 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Most consecutive days greater than or equal 75, 11. That's just happened. And the smokiest summer and so on. Driest June to August 16th. <clears throat> Stretch 20% of normal. Okay, so um, I want to mention it. I have to give myself a reminder because I'm a member of the CRS club. It has rained so much that in Denali, the mudslides, <clears throat> on the mudslides block the only road that goes into the, uh, the park. And the, the road uh, traffic is restricted. Uh, you can't take your private vehicle on there. Uh, you have to take a tour bus. And... The tour buses are about eight feet wide, and the road in a lot of places is 15 feet wide. And it's a two way. Hmm. So there, there are times where it gets very interesting when buses meet up, one going one way, the other coming back, or whatever. Especially at Polychrome Pass. But be as it may, the mudslides basically block the road, and there were a whole bunch of uh, tourists, whatever, on the other side of the mudslide, they couldn't get out. So I heard they just recently cleared the road of the mudslide and so on, and so now uh, those tourists are able to to exit the park. That's what I've been doing here. I've been sharing uh, some of the information I've shared with you. I've incorporated from the other articles. This is big. There's fires across the circumpolar north, for example, in Siberia. Siberia is also burning up. Last year it was Sweden. There was some in Scandinavia again this year. Last year in Sweden, there was a lot of fires north of the Arctic Circle. Circumpolar north is basically being, is, is hot, dry, and just burning up. And of course, you start burning up there, that heat's going to start reaching you. Yes, it's the permafrost in the ground. You start thawing that out. Releasing CH4, methane. This is alarming. In the, uh, the Nome region, the Bering Sea, the salmon returning to spawn. 
a lot of them are dying before reaching the spawning ground to uh, basically lay their eggs. They're dying because the water is so warm. And remember, a lot of these fish are uh, steenothermal. Going to tolerate an hour range of temperatures. The water is so warm, it's literally giving the salmon heart attacks. And they're going belly up by the thousands. This is going to have horrible implications for the salmon fishery. But, you know, we're basically talking the Bristol Bay uh, fisheries here, which is one of the biggest, if not the biggest, salmon fishery on the planet. You know, pebble mine aside, you know, the, the, the mining company wants to mine the crap out of there, put all the effluent in the in Bristol Bay, which will destroy the fisheries. That's another story. But basically, it's so, you, you saw the, the, the information earlier. It's so much, the water is so much hotter in the Bering Sea that uh, the, the salmon experience a basic thermal shock when they try to return to spawn. So this is going to negatively and adversely affect the salmon fishes for years to come. Your class strength will decrease. It, it's not going to be good. Okay, I wanted to give some uh, acknowledgments here. Many of the uh, graphics and figures in the presentation are courtesy of Rick Tolman and Brett, uh, excuse me, Brian Brett Schneider, both of whom are uh, associated with the National Weather Service, which is part of the the National Arctic Research Center, IARC, my old place where I work. They're both meteorologists. Uh, this is uh, Rick Tolman's uh, Twitter handle, and then Brian's uh, Twitter handle is Climatologist 49, 49 is the last is 49 state. Other graphics are courtesy of NOAA and SIDC, other agencies. And if you go, you know, look, if you review the presentation and you pause the video, you can see it's uh, indicated on the slides. So these figures, you get to be published in peer reviewed journals. It's going to take time. Some are impressed of. They reflect the latest data and can be soon to be accurate. I know these two gentlemen are excellent scientists, and I can trust the information they share. A lot of the stuff they're just tweeting out. So this is just not out there in the Twitter sphere. That's not giving you the, uh, the, the the Twitter handle. But yeah, they're just uh, tweeting this out, sharing the information. Uh, Basically, hot off the presses, giving us a kind of play-by-play what was happening. Because, you know, they have the access to the computers and the satellite data and the information. So I'm really appreciative of them, of, of, of them doing that and providing the information. Uh, <clears throat> Rick and I pretty much uh, tweet back and forth a bit. But, uh, you yeah, uh, know, he's, he's a really good guy. Um, so I, I wanted to give uh, the acknowledgement that... Uh, Great majority of the of the graphics I shared with you are courtesy of, of their information. So um, anyway, I hope th th this this kind of tells you what's going on here in Moscow. How crazy this summer has been. Record warmth, very dry conditions, fires burning all over the place. Then you turn around, you have torrential rain. You know, right now it's the, uh, August is the fourth wettest uh, there. Uh, August in Fairbanks history, August tends to be the wet month of the year. Still got 10 days left to go. We're probably going to set a record or come close to it, um, being probably the wettest August ever. No joke up here. Don't like the rain? The rain will eventually stop when it turns to snow. <laughs> so, And uh, I just saw an indication that some areas of uh, some temperatures of where I live in the Goldstream Valley, uh, the temperature is below freezing, 30, 31 degrees. Knock down the mosquitoes, thank you. So, again, what happens in Alaska and the Arctic will affect the rest of the planet. That's why I'm sharing this with you. It's not here to complain, oh, it's been shitty up here. No, it's a and it will let you know it's like you can start expecting something. And with this extremely negative NAO, you know, again, go to my video where I discuss in detail all about the NAO to get a, what that means and what, what the possible implications of going forward, what the winter could bring, depending on where you live. But things are changing and humans are the cause of it. So I thank you for your time. 
And I hope you found this interesting and informative. And uh, until next time, thanks for watching.